Ted. Yes, Alex? Let me tell you about Thunder Man. Time swaps complete failures at Kickstarter. Emotes go farther than words. The first of many fuck yous. Like a fucking Looney Tunes? The only stipulation was behave yourself and keep your dick in your pants, and you have not followed through on that. The thing is, I actually learned a lot about economics from playing Neo. Hey, Alex. Yes, Ted? Let me tell you about uh, the old suits and the new blood. All right, so with Kickstarter and angel funding, is it angel funding or angel investing? I think it's it's angel investing. I've never heard of that term before. Angel investing is more of an actual business term, I believe, where it's like, hey, I have no real reason to know, you know, I, I don't have... You know, it's incredibly high risk for me to give you this money, and I'm just hoping that with this money you're able to do this project, which is, you know, crowdfunding. You say, hey, I have this cool idea, and then instead of pitching it to a publisher, you pitch it to people, and then they give you money to make it. Because you're a startup company, and you're like, man, we don't have $50,000, but golly gee, we sure do want to make a game. Or... You're a bunch of people who used to work on games 20 years ago, and you're like, hey, let's get everyone, let's let's get the gang back together and make a fun, fun video game called Ukulele. Okay, okay, okay. So I actually want to say something about Ukulele. So I did, in fact, back it. Did you back it, Ted? I did. Okay, so I backed it to get the game, and I'm like, I had money at the time because I had... I just had a shitload of money. It came out during some point where I just got a shitload of money out of somewhere. I'm just like, you know what? I remember liking Banjo. Eh, why the hell not? I'll be, I'm basically pre-ordering the game. You know, I don't really care. I donated the minimum amount to like, get the game. And uh, that was that was it. But uh, one update they did early on, because it wasn't the first one. It wasn't like the base, like, whatever. They said, oh yeah, with enough of it, we're going to put up their uh, stretch goals now because getting so much money. And uh, one of them was a ukulele, like, startup rap, like the DK rap. And I immediately said to myself, oh, God, this game's going to suck, isn't it? <laughs> well, Alex, it's a funny meme rap. Why didn't you like it? See, I, I knew, like, I had faith, like, you know what? They want to just recapture the old magic. I trust them. And then just like, we're going to do this. I'm just like, oh, they're actually just nostalgia uh, hooking people into this. You, 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 you're, you're evil, aren't you, you little bastards? Then Grant Kirpo did this little thing where he's, like, playing his music in his, in his, like, fucking pool. I'm like, okay, maybe they're not evil, but I still don't trust them to be competent. Maybe they're just retarded, is what I thought. And that ended up being true, because they say they learned all the lessons from shit like Banjo-Tooie. They did everything... They just made remade Banjo-Tooie, but only the bad parts of Banjo-Tooie. Yeah, yeah. So, Ukulele came out... Uh, fuck, was it last year? It was either last year, or vi- I think it was last year in April. Uh, early, you know, spring 2016. And it was a video game. I mean, it... So when you think of Rare, you think of motherfucking Donkey Kong Country. You think of motherfucking, um, Goldeneye. Morty. You think of motherfucking... Banjo and also Conker. Those are the two I think of. Yeah, you think of very high quality games that are fun experiences that you played when you were like twelve. Yeah, well, yeah, because like now they make sports games for the fucking Xbox, and that's because uh, they were bought out by Microsoft at some points, and then a bunch of people jumped ship, and then that got all messy. But Ukulele, as it started off, there was a lot of people who liked it, and then there was kind, of, then it was like a sharp drop off. After a certain amount of time, I think it was like a week, people were like, oh, wait. Yeah, this game kind of sucks. I wouldn't say it sucks, but it, it's the worst. It's actually the worst out of the three things it could have been. It's meh. Yeah. 
really there's if your game is really really good hey that's awesome if it's really really bad then it's like we remembered for being bad like garshas the monster slayer yeah how much was that wasn't it 75 cents no it was a dollar and like i want to say 34 cents because on sale i got that in the sequel and i want and i should have gotten a refund on them <laughs> Garshasp the Monster Slayer. Okay, we're gonna cut into the. We're gonna make this Garshasp episode for five minutes. Hold up. You know how bad Garshasp Monster Slayer was, Dad, and the people out there listening? Okay. <laughs> Game starts off. Immediately starts off in 800 by 600 resolution. Now, obviously, I can, <laughs> I can fix that, but I don't want to at this point. So, the, I go to the menu. A doesn't. There's a fucking. Uh, use a button on the menu. The B button does on my Xbox controller. And I'm like, uh oh, this game's gonna be bad, isn't it? So the the cutscene plays and the combat starts. So when I was using the analog stick to move, he would just dodge because the movement keys were the D pad and the dodge buttons were on the analog stick. <laughs> and what? And I'm like, oh my god, was this game made in 2001? What the fuck is this shit? It's so like, like when I you play the- an old PC game and it's like. You use fucking ESDF to move, or you use the fucking number pad. Yeah, when people didn't know how to make games yet. So, yeah, I have 10 minutes played of that game, and I think it was the worst <laughs> game I've ever played. Because <laughs> it's a game that I just picked up, immediately felt this is going to be bad, and I just couldn't stand it. Much like Final Fantasy The City, another game that I picked up and just played it was awful. But anyway, back to Ukulele. This game so, was a game that I picked up, and I knew, like, it was immediately going to be just... Uh, okay, okay. There's an onion joke. A long time ago. Really old. It was like a 2015 upload. I could be totally wrong with that. Where it was like, hey, like, is it breaking news? Four old college friends get back together to wear their old college jerseys and hang out and remember the good old days. And they're totally not pathetic what, uh, whatsoever. And it shows <laughs> like four like really old dudes wearing college jackets. And the onion, is, the, the newscasters are just ripping on them so hard. And that's pretty much ukulele. It's a bunch of really old dudes who haven't, who made good video games almost two decades ago, and are trying to do what worked twenty years ago, and not really what works now. Yeah, so like I'm gonna be this. Ass- Sorry, I cut you up again, but I'm gonna be an asshole and just say platformers die naturally. It's kind of a reason. Yeah, there's you know, the the reason that 3D platformers were so popular was people were just getting started with 3D games. You're not really sure how to go about doing level design type stuff. So why don't you make a big environment and people run around, collect things, and there you go. Okay. And this ended up working out pretty well for about a generation. And then after the GameCube, it stopped because now we know how to properly do a 3D adventure game or whatever. Yeah, the only people who make 3D platforms anymore are is like Nintendo. That's it. Like everyone's moved on to like the mascot platformers it was called was Super duper big in like the N64 era. I think that was the fifth gen of consoles. And then the sixth gen was the GameCube PS2 and Xbox. Everyone was trying to get in on it. Like even Xbox had that fucking stupid cat and the voodoo guy. Like everybody was trying for it until someone cracked the code. Whoever made the first fucking World War II shooter, that just became the meme game. And we've it been kind of writing um... off shooters for a while. It was Call of Duty 4, I think, that really made that tick over, because that was the one that got super, super, super popular. Because there was Brother of Arms and a few other kind of, you know, more gritty first person games before that. But I think that was the one that really ticked it over and like, oh, shit, this actually works really well. Yeah, anyway, midway through that generation, that, that yeah. it all died out and except for Nintendo. But uh, but continue. back to ukulele. So yeah, yeah. The, what happened with ukulele was uh, I want to say it was around uh, it was around the early 2010s. There was some rumbling and some grumbling, some hikumbokum, hikumbokum, you know, some kind of mumble voices about, hey, why don't we try and get together and make a new game? You know, all these people that were from Rare, you know, everyone let's try and get back together and do it. And then they decided, like, eh, I don't think now's the proper time. I don't think we can do this because they, they the, the the thing they wanted to do was they didn't want to be under a publisher a larger publisher because they wanted to make a game where they could do you know they wanted to go full hog in what they wanted to do they didn't want to have to deal with a bunch of other stuff and then uh broken age happened and this is before the second part of broken age came out and everyone realized oh this game just fucking sucks and tim schaefer is a hack 
uh, it was before that. You know, so everyone was still really hopeful because Broken Age came out and that kind of made the idea of, oh, shit, why don't we try this? And, you know, all the, you know, I think the I think the Broken Age was the first one. There's one that was funded like immediately afterwards, and I still don't know why. Was it was, was Money Number like, Nine or Broken Age first when it came to big, big successes? Define success. I meant like getting a lot of fucking money on hype. Broken that, Age for sure. Okay. Broken Age was what made Kickstarter a platform because they got three point three million dollars. Which honestly, in in defense of Broken Age, three point three million sounds like a lot for game development. That's actually not that much. When you get like a nice medium sized company, it's not very much. Like even Undertale was fifty five thousand. That's one guy. Basically, just think like fifty thousand per person on a game. Especially if you're located in like New York City or L.A., where a lot of those people are, then you got to pay a living wage, my dude. Anyway, so if that happens, there was a game, Guiana Sisters, which got sued by Nintendo when it first came out. And this is from the word of mouth of Joe. So take this with a grain of salt. But it was just it was on the Amiga and it was just a straight ripoff of Super Mario Brothers. And that got remade into one of the worst video games I've ever played in my fucking life. Uh, called Guiana Sisters Twisted Dreams. And I think that game, if you've never seen it, look it up on YouTube. That is the quintessential, I funded a game on Kickstarter because of the name and not because of how the gameplay looked. Because it looks like, uh, what, what I, as the French say, it looks like shit. And it plays <laughs> like garbage. <laughs> so... They make, uh, you know, uh, ukulele comes out. You know, there's a bunch. They're doing that little kind of social media buzzing thing. They make a Twitter account, kind of hint at the idea. They called it Project Ukulele, and you know, they started up like, oh yeah, here we go. And wham, bam, thank you, man. Check this out. All the old devs, citation needed from Rare, coming back. We're making a game, guys. It's gonna be great. We're gonna have a lizard and a bat. What's up with that? And people, you know, immediately, it's funded. Immediately. Because it's fucking, it's rare. I mean, hey. It's it's a revival of Banjo-Kazooie, and Banjo-Kazooie's fucking huge. So, I don't know if they, they, they must not have gotten all the developed, they must not have had the, like, level designers for Banjo-Kazooie come back, or... No, they, they just, did, they did. It was it Or was they the just guy... haven't made a game in 20 years, and I guess forgot how it works. Close. It's a little of both. They got the guy who designed the levels of Donkey Kong 64... I mean, that's what it feels like. But so ukulele did come out eventually. It took a little while. And I'm just going to say right off the top here. I do not believe that the ukulele devs went into this thinking, let's make a bad game. I don't think that's the case at all. I think it is because the game was made in Unity. I think some of it must have been they must have had some kind of difficulty with this game engine they, there must have been a whole bunch of shit that came up that stopped them from... Because it, it's one of two options. One, they just didn't really... It's just been so long that they were rusty. And they weren't like, ah, fuck, I forget how to make a good game. Or two, they just had so much trouble with the engine that they put together what they could and were like, hey, uh, here you go. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Maybe we'll try again in a few years or not. I don't know. There was a few things the game actually did really well. Uh, about three of them, four of them, because that's as much as I could list. Uh, the space pirate level was pretty cool, but they actually didn't do much fun stuff with that. It was pretty much just a normal level without many gimmicks. Uh, the icy, me icy metric castle was a fun gimmicky. It had that rare feel of like, hey, here's a silly little tongue in cheek area. That's icy metric castle and it's isometric. Ha <laughs> ha, look at all this goofy stuff. They did have actually fun characters like Trouser and Rextrosaurus 64. I thought those were fun. Uh, and they had really good mumble voices. Those were all of the pluses I could give the game. Hey, Shovel Knight was in that game. That's a good plus. Oh, ho, yo, ho, ho, ho. Yeah, he had a good voice. Because uh, I, I want to stay positive because I would love to see them try to make a game again. Give it another shot and see if they can make something even better. Because I played a lot of Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie when I was younger. You know, 
I enjoyed those games a lot. I would love to see them try it again. The the biggest downfall of ukulele. Well, here, I'm going to go down my list of uh, the downsides I have for ukulele. Number one, Grant Kirkhope's music wasn't that great. I don't know what happened. Like, there's no memorable tune in ukulele that I can think of. Okay, I actually have one memorable tune. It's the theme they actually posted on the Kickstarter like four years ago called Jungle Challenge, which wasn't made by Grant Kirkham, it was made by David Wise. He was the Donkey Kong guy, right? I think so. I don't fully remember, but like... Yeah, he's the Donkey Kong dude. But here's the thing, here's the thing, here's the thing, here's the thing. Here's what pissed me off. I was playing the entire game, waiting for when this really good song plays. It does eventually play, and it's slightly remixed, and they slightly like changed up, because that was, that was you know three years ago or whatever the fuck. You know, it's been re- uh, revised and uh even though it's called jungle challenge it doesn't play in the jungle levels like cart challenge which by the way all those sucked uh it plays during the ending because i knew it was the best song they just put it at the end you know it was the only good song they had in that whole fucking game yeah it i don't know because because hat in time i think the hat in time kickstarter actually did come out first and then, yeah, because because they were going to do ukulele, then they put it on the back, then they put it on the back burner. Hat and Time is announced; it gets like half a million or something. And then a few months later, like, oh shit, yeah, let's do this. And Hat and Time actually had Grant Kirkhope on to make some guest songs, and then he only made about two songs. He was like, "Hey guys, uh, I I got to go work on ukulele." And I remember this because the Hat and Time Kickstarter was like, hey, guys, unfortunately, Grant Kirkhope is leaving. You know, he wants to go over and do this. We're not going to force him to stay here. What do you guys want as a replacement for him? Because we only got two songs and they had I forget what it was, but they came to a good they came to a came to a reasonable uh, compromise. But I don't know what happened with ukulele. I don't know why his music didn't stick out. It, okay. There was no song in there that was like, oh, hell yeah, this is freeze easy peak. You know, oh, this is banging. There's okay. nothing like that. So here's my issue with Grant Kirkhope's music in this game. And I actually, again, with the Kickstarter, when they, when they mentioned the rap thing, for my opinion really early, and it ended up being right, when they posted David Wise and Grant Kirkhope's like, little beta tracks for what they want for the music style of the game, when I heard Grant Kirkhope's, I'm just like, oh wow, it's just bootleg fucking banjo music. I don't even remember how it went. It was just burnt, 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 with the fucking little, the little banjo, like, fucking, I don't even want to call them horns, the dooters playing, <laughs> the dooters. and the xylophone. And I'm just like, yeah, it sounds like uh, a banjo level, question mark. Then David Wise had, like, this fucking, I can picture a landscape. When I, when I heard Jungle Challenge, I'm sure it's something to think of a fucking minecart level. But that's what all the challenges were. I pictured it would be some kind of weird, for uh, jungle-themed because it was called Jungle Challenge, where you would be, like, flying through the air on, like, wind currents to, like, get up with, like, your with your little bat hover ability and, like, platform through shit. Sure, I was wrong, but I could... That, that, that theme made me picture a level. They, uh, Grant Kirkhope's didn't. So, like, it just... It was just there. It wasn't like, say, when I hear Rusty Bucket Bay from Banjo-Kazooie, where, where like, it's like, burp, 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 and then the music stops, and you hear the fucking, like, uh, whistle. Yeah, the, fuck, the, the fucking horn blow. First off, that's an amazing thing in music. Second off, that's that, that, that has the theme of this dirty-ass fucking boat that you're on, but it stops to let you know that the fucking boat is still operating. Like, like, it's, like it is a fucking moving machine, you know? Like, it gives you this feel of the level. If I never played Rusty Bucket Bay, I know it's a boat level because the fucking boat goes off, right? I, I never played Click Clock Woods, and you could still know what Click Clock Woods was about by the music and how it changes per season. You can immediately get the gimmick by just fucking listening to the music, you dig? You yeah, don't get yeah, that yeah. with any of his music in ukulele, because I don't fucking remember anything other than David Weiss's one song from four years ago. Now I have the whole soundtrack right there from back in it, I listen to it. it. Doesn't leave anything in imagination. It feels like the game is not really focused. The art style itself really doesn't even have a style. It's got the Dota swirly fantasy. But that, that, that I mentioned back when I was talking about Gigantic and I Noise Boys forever ago. That 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 fantasy swirly style that's in everything. Yeah, there was. It, uh, so so the levels that were in the game were act were really 
boring. It's like, okay, jungle makes sense. You know, you got the lizard, you got the bat. Okay, we got a jungle. Does it feel like a jungle at all? It's just like an air. It's just like, here's a temple in the middle and a bunch of rocks that you're able to just jump on and skip over half the level. Also, no, also feathers that don't work how they're supposed to. They don't work like how you're supposed to use collectibles in a point and if I not a point click a fucking N64 style platform. What the fuck were you doing? There's- yeah, they they made they made them hidden collectibles as well to like 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 hidden around when you're supposed to use like notes. That's what these were to lead you to places. That's the entire point of coins and shit. That's why in fucking like old games, they would sometimes make an arrow or something out of coins. They're legit breadcrumbs. They're not supposed to be hidden. But the, the levels were like jungle, swamp, casino, ice level, uh, space level. And I think that's it. And even then, like the casino level, that sounds like a fun idea. But that was the worst level in the game because it's just here's a bunch of things you you go over to once, press a button, win it and then run away. Like here's just this giant box room that you're in and everything just feels bad. Also, my big issue was like, okay, okay, I'm going to be completely real with you, Dad. I have four and a half hours in this fucking game. I couldn't get past the ice level because I got so bored. I was falling asleep playing this game. I've only once fallen asleep playing a video game. That was uh, playing a game <laughs> when uh, playing a game with Dota as Darkseer. I actually fell asleep on my controller, or uh, my uh, keyboard, <laughs> and my friend had to wake <laughs> me up. Cause, cause, cause I didn't sleep the previous day. That's why. Oh no, actually no. Sorry, twice. Legit, this actually happened. I was playing Warlords of Draenor, and again, I didn't sleep the previous day. We were doing a raid in fucking Blackrock Foundry. I legit fell asleep when we were having like downtime with someone to go take a smoke or smoke break or something. And I woke up 15 minutes later. I'm like, oh shit! I, I re-entered like the it wasn't Discord. I think I think they were still using Vent at the time. I'm like, did I miss the boss? Like, yeah, you idiot. Where'd you go? I'm like, I fell asleep. <laughs> and uh, gotcha, good. So like in normal Blackrock Foundry, I had every boss killed besides that guy with all the animals because I slept through that boss fight. They just reinvited me. We just kept going, but I, I skipped that one. Ha ha. But anyway, ukulele was almost my third one. The thing that made me realize that this game was like, okay, okay. The jungle level I actually didn't hate. Uh, or the, floor, the temple, whatever. But, like, I saw some issues with it. It, it. it was really, really wide open with not a lot of stuff in the middle of the places. Like, imagine if, like, you're on a big open ocean and they're just islands of content. And then just between the, the thing of water, there's nothing there. That's basically UK lately. Like, say when I start out, here's one of the ghost guys, here's six feathers. And there's nothing else here now. I just I just move on, find the skeleton lady, explorer. She she gives me a fucking I'm just gonna call him a jiggy. She gives me a PG right here. Uh boom, and now I'm done with that area. Bye. I move on to the next one. Nothing happens. Move over here, find this guy, get a PG. Then I'm just move over here. There's nothing and then it's a really, really long trek from finding this shit. There's nothing like actually in the middle to entertain me. Because it's just this flat ground you're running across with your ball power. They're forgetting the platforming part. Also, oh my god, the ball power. What the fuck is wrong with you? Okay, so I guess they thought it was a problem in Banjo Kazooie where you, when you got Talon Trot, you moved a little bit faster. And so it just kind of like, uh-oh, uh-oh. Banjo Kazooie is a game made entirely of annoying noises. <laughs> it's just so you use talent charts like as you're running around as that constantly because banjo is slow and i guess they thought that's a big deal so now you have to use a ball that could, uh, so now there's a power meter which okay i mean whatever that just means that you guys don't have to you know scatter energy containers all over the level now but the ball controls like you're on a ball and you have to use it to do very, very strict platforming segments. And it's fucking terrible because if you try to turn around, you have to spin around and it is, oh my God, I don't know. It it just baffles me. It's like the final boss of Sticker Star where it just fucking baffles me that no one at any point said, hey, this controls like fucking shit and I am not having fun with this. Okay, 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 okay. 
the game started to get declined. Like, I, I, I was like, this game's getting a little mad, but this is just the first level, you know? Like, whatever. I'll stick through it. Maybe this just isn't a good level, you know? So, I get to the boss of the first area. You know, the, the fucking... Uh, the wall? Big, the wall, Which is yes. the same it's, boss that gets repeated three times? He's in the other levels? It's, exa- it's a reskin of him. Oh my god, okay. Well, anyway, it's the fucking wall boss that spits logs at you. And I'll, I'll you go up this fucking thing. I forget his fucking name. That, and... that boss was terrible, too, because you had to use the ball power up to go up the thing. But you had to jump, and at the very, very top of your jump, you'll go over the things. But the camera was also really shit, and there was no reaction to you doing things, so it just felt bad. It was just not a well-designed boss fight, because it felt like I wasn't fighting the boss. I was just trying to fight my fucking controller. You know what I mean? Yeah. Didn't feel like I was actually doing anything. The thing that actually made me like just stop playing this game was the ice level. Because the ice level was just like even bigger and boringer than the first one. There was like no enemies to actually fight to keep me like interested in what I was fucking doing. There weren't a shitload of enemies everywhere in Banjo, but there were threats in Banjo that kept you on your toes. Or at the very least, there were obstacles to move around in. Let's let's look at the fucking the first level of Banjo Kazooie, there are no pits or anything. It's the very first level. It's a mountain, but it's it's the couple of the little fucking purple tribal dudes and the ants, and then the fucking big gorilla, and that's it. It's a really small area, and nothing to fall down in. You just kind of run around. You learn that you can't run up hills unless you're in the bird. You know, you got all this shit to learn. So, oh, and there's the bull. I almost forgot about him. But there's there's little things just there to just kind of learn things. Then you go to the fucking the pirate bay. Now, there's little pits, pits of water, there's the shark, there's the trees you can climb up to get to the second level, so you already have two ways to get around everywhere. You've got the fucking timer challenge with the fucking fat pirate, with Captain Blubber, whatever the fuck his name was. Then you get the flying ability here, and you get to fly around the area, you get to traverse everywhere now. You're not stuck on this flat-ass boring ground all fucking day. There's levels to this level, you know what I mean? It's layers. With, with the fucking second level of this game, they tried to have, like, a layer to it, where, like, you can climb up that big fucking ice thing with a really, really, really bad uh, truck driving power up that sucked ass. And, like, it just felt like they didn't know how to make a 3D platformer <laughs> anymore. It felt like there were some things, some very, very simple things that... Okay, so when you're so you're playing Banjo Kazooie, you see a skull hut in the background. You go over there, you boom, doom, 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 doom. Oh, wait, no, that's that's Don Cox sixty four. You're like, you hear ikum boka bon, don ikum boka ba. You know, you you hear that music in that little house, but it's overlaid kind of with the um the world theme as you get closer to it. At least I think it did that. I don't I don't know. I'm getting them all confused now, but there was a room you go into. Why? So, so in this in this game, when you find the mumbo equivalent, she's just there. She's just kind of standing there, and she doesn't feel like she belongs there at all. She's just like slapped into fucking places. It looks really, really weird. Like Mumbo's hut was slapped into places, but there was always little things that made it nice. Example: in the snow level, Mumbo's hut was covered in snow, so it looked like it belonged there just a little bit. And it was always Mumbo in his house. He just happened to live across many different places, you know? With Dr. Puzz, uh, she fucking was just, like, there with her big gray gun, slapped into just a level. And it felt so awkward. And that's actually the thing with a lot of the fucking characters. The weird pig knight just feels slapped in there. The weird sign guy just feels slapped in there. They don't feel like they belong anywhere. Like, with Banjo-Kazooie, there are NPCs every world. Like, Captain Blubber was just in the pirate world. Clanker was just in Clanker's cavern. You know what I mean? The fucking beaver from Donkey Kong Country was only in Click Clock Wood. Yeah, there was... It? There was... I, I'm trying to think of... So so for the ice world, they had a few of those, but all they were were just... Uh, the snowmen were, with the hats. Yeah, they were, they were snowmen, and then you had to go and you had to get their hats. And that was all right. I mean, there was, like, there was a funny one there where they had... Um, they had one wearing yellow shorts on top of his head, and he was speaking like he had the the banjo mumbles. There's one that had Gruntilda's sweater, and they and she rhymed when she spoke. You know that was like cheeky little ha ha. There's a funny little 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 us gamers reference. 
And then, uh, in, well, in you the can't car- really shit on him for that because this entire game yeah, is yeah, yeah, built on I mean. nostalgia. Dude. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's a good. It was just a funny little ha ha thing that was just in there. The swamp level had it, a bunch of people apparently were really confused about the swamp thing, but what it was was um, there was a bunch of mine carts or there was a bunch of shopping carts. And actually, okay, so it made sense to me just because I made the mental leap of people dumping stuff in a swamp. But you want to know what that swamp environment was? It was just a, the middle of a swamp. What you could have done is have a big factory, have, have uh, you know, Big Mart dumping a bunch of garbage into the swamp. And that's why we have these things here. You know, that's what you could have done. You could have done something really fun like that. But instead, you just didn't you just didn't do it. And so these carts just kind of felt odd and out of place. And I don't even think there were NPCs in the in the um, in the space world either. The, the, every area in this game felt like it was a big, empty, open space without a real world inside of it. They're like, they're like, okay, like I said, when you're going from place to place, you're not even like you're just going across like a flat plane of fucking ground. Then get to the next mini mini quest for a pagey. You're not actually like even jumping. Or, like, trying to move over there. At least from the two fucking levels I fucking played. Maybe it got better. It I don't know. Not really. Uh, uh, okay. Well, it yeah. just feels like the fun... Okay, first off, the moving around, getting to the places isn't fun. Even Mario Odyssey, in a place that you can't even fall off or die in with no enemies, see, New Donk City, they let you run the fuck around and jump up wherever you want to climb around and get around the fucking city. They make it fun to move around. Ukulele isn't fun to move around in. It's boring to get from one place to the next because nothing really keeps me going. The music in my ear isn't keeping me entertained either, as we just mentioned earlier. The NPCs sure as hell ain't keeping me entertained. Nothing is actually keeping me... Nothing's actually sucking me into the fun of this game. Mm-hmm. And so... So... Uh, so let's talk... So Ukulele was made by people who let's were get, developers Let's get to the, the new blood part now. Yeah. Ukulele's... Developers in the past, people that seem to be content with repeating what worked in the past and not bothering to like, they're they're not looking back at things and trying to make improvements. They're like, okay, people want to make, people want to play Banjo-Kazooie, let's just make Banjo-Kazooie again and fail at it. So Hat in Time, so right off the bat, Hat in Time only has five worlds, which I think is the same as Ukulele. It has an overworld that's very, very small. It's just a spaceship. Ukulele had an overworld that just wasn't neat or fun to explore at all. Which, I mean, first Banjo Kazooie didn't have one really that much either. You just ran around in Grintilda's castle. Banjo Tooie had a fun overworld, though, because you got to travel all around Isle of Hags. But Hat and Time's levels, there's the, the, the first world right off the bat. It's a really unique idea. It's an island in the middle of the ocean that's got a big spire on it, and it's filled with mafia chefs and it's like okay there's a, all right the first world you know you have a center spire you can't get lost because there's one area in the middle and then everything just kind of loops around that in a big circle which is like okay you just go around in a circle you go up and down up and down you'll find everything you know you'll see everything that's there uh it does it instead of doing the banjo kazooie you grab a jiggy and then do 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 and then you continue. It did the Mario 64 style of you get something, you go back to the start, come back, bop, 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 you know? Oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be real with, with you on all 3D platformers. I fucking hate the really, really long jingles when you collect shit. Super Mario 64, you grab it, do a peace sign, and it's fucking over. I hated in Jack and Dexter when you fucking grabbed it, did this whole fucking like dance, and then you put it in your backpack. Like, Shut up. I, I love that, Alex. It. I thought it was great. Yeah, but like after like three hours, I get it. You're really <laughs> happy you got a power cell. Fuck off. Ukulele right? actually makes it feel really, really good when you finish a level. Because so so you say you finish the first one. The first one is you have to you, you stop the mafia from doing a thing. You go over there and then you know it appears it goes down do 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 and the hourglass appears. And then around the hourglass, there's a giant sphere. When you're in there, the music like 
goes real, real quiet and starts playing like a like a calming, like reflecting thing. Like, yeah, you did it. You beat this level. Fuck yeah. Good job, dude. And then you collect it and it's like, hell yeah, I beat this level. You know, you, you instinctively think like, OK, this is the stuff I did to get here. Oh, this is awesome. I beat it. I done. I done did it. You know, and, and even if you do and you decide like, OK, I beat this. I'm going to go fuck off. You can just leave that bubble and the music goes back to normal and you just keep exploring, you know. Uh, but the the level ideas in Hat in Time, Alex, cover your ears for this one because some of the I'm gonna spoil a few of them. I mean, I don't care about spoilers. I'm like you idiots. I don't well, care. Whatever. So I'm not some some stupid idiot who goes like, man, they told me that thing that was probably really obvious in the fucking video game for ten year olds happened. Well, <laughs> trying to just fucking kill myself. <laughs> well, I can't enjoy anything anymore. God forbid I see it and experience it for myself. Someone told me vague bits about it. Ugh, completely right, fine, fucking Alex. ruined. Okay, so the levels are... The first level is the mafia. It's like Mario Sunshine Mafia World. The second level is like a spooky dead... Or the, the second level is a movie thing. Wow, I can't fucking play it now. You just told me everything I needed to hear. So the, and, and each world has a gimmick behind it as to how that world plays out. The third one's like a like a dead forest. There's spirit fire and there's a spooky woods. Uh, the fourth world is the biggest change, which that one I'll talk about is an entirely different segment. Uh, actually, I think there's only four worlds. Yeah, there's only only four worlds. And then like the last the last world. There's actually two other acts in the game, two full like finished, mostly finished worlds that they cut because they're like, ah, eh, these ones don't feel that great. So we, they, they would rather have a shorter game that feels fun throughout than to have a longer game where there's two subpar areas, which is really, really good. But uh, Hat in Time's art style is consistent. It's got and, and some people might not like it because it's very, very bright. They use a lot of solid colors in that indie game style where you know that your game's like not super it's not super high fidelity graphics so you kind of i'm gonna i'm gonna be real like i think hat in time visually looks like shit the bloom i turned it off like immediately uh the bloom is really it's like wind waker hd where the bloom is turned up to 95 percent. you know what i'm talking about yeah yeah i know what you're talking about i've seen it but so a few of the other uh, other i have like I have only four or five minuses on Hat in Time. The rest are all pluses. I'll play it eventually because I'm interested. Uh, the in the in the game there are remixes that you can unlock for levels to apply on them for when you play them later. You know you can get several different remixes. Uh, there is workshop support to make your own levels, and uh, John Tron's in it making eh noises. There's a <laughs> Homestar Runner reference. Which is there's a point and click adventure machine you, or a text based adventure machine. You go there, and one of the directions you can go is Dennis. And if you go Dennis, you win. Uh, the music <laughs> okay. is way better than ukuleles, even if it includes remixes. Like, well, the remixes are in the game, right? You can turn them on. Yeah, what you do is you um. If they're in the game, then that means they're part of the game, which means that it's better than ukulele. It's fair to keep uh, to count them. Yeah, because what you do is there's, um, you remember in Mario Sunshine where you would enter some areas and there'd be a platformer section where you didn't have flood? Mm -hmm. There are those in the game. And when you finish them, you know, you get the you get the jiggy at the end and then there's a slot machine that goes down. You press a, you know, you get three chances to get a cool item and there's either paint, which changes the the the, the palette colors for you and your hats. Uh, a flare for one of your hats because you, you have different powers. And you unlock all your powers in the first like two worlds. You get them immediately, which is good because then you can go and continue playing the game without having to come back because you didn't have you didn't have the ice hat yet. You know, it doesn't pull a Metroid on you. Yeah. So you can get like like the ice hat is a little um, a little beanie that's got cat ears, but you can get a flare that changes that to a Santa hat or you can change some other hat or a different hat that has the same effect. But you can you, you can change it just by doing these slot machine things. Uh. I will say though, Hat Girl's face model is fucking terrible. Oh my god, the player model when you look at it up close is really shitty. Uh the characters that you meet in the game are kind of bland. Like, except for uh the conductor, the mafia henchman, 
and the and Ghost Dad. I forget his name. Ghost Dad from the Ghost World. He's pretty neat, and the conductor's fun, and the and the mafia dudes. Because when you when in the first world you walk around Mafia Town, and they won't they won't automatically go for you to punch you, but if you walk past them or talk to them, they'll say like, "Oh, uh, ma- uh, seagulls say please don't beat me up. I have children." So Mafia laugh and hit him with child. It's very funny. You laugh now, and shit like that. Like they're just there. Uh, it has voice acting that is absolutely atrocious. <laughs> it is so bad. the The main antagonist is Mustache Girl, and her voice is. It, it sounds like someone doing a bad tracer. It sounds like someone doing a racist tracer impression. It's. I immediately as soon as I heard that, after the first time I heard her speak, I pressed start, went into the options, and muted voices. <laughs> It was so bad. There's a guy you can buy badges that give you little bits. Uh, the first one that I bought cost 700 rupees or gems or whatever the fuck. Notes, jiggies, whatever. It cost 700. I farmed it up before I finished the first mission to give everyone mumble voices. Where they'd talk like, ha, ha, he, hoo hoo ha, hoo hoo ha. Which, by the way, I think that every, just about all games should be handled like that. I think voice acting in games has gotten a little too out of hand. But I'll save that for another podcast episode. But yeah, so Hat in Time, okay, so when I was exploring a world in ukulele, how I would do it is like, oh, I need to get over here. Let me jump on this rock. Okay, let me jump over, double jump onto this jutting out edge of a rock, do that three more times, and now I'm gl- I'm like standing half on a rock, and then I jumped over to my area. There was They just put the models in there, like, ah, eh, fuck it, whatever, because I had no direction. I had no idea how to properly... I went to the top of the of the temple and came down around the other side and met Shovel Knight because I didn't know that I was supposed to go that way. There was no jiggies pointing it out there or anything. No, 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 uh, no, it's no feathers. Bird coming you the way they should have been. Yeah. Hat in Time does that because their gems aren't they're not even like their currency that you could just get over and over and over again, you know? They're not a collectible that there's only 100 of in the world. And so they just kind of litter them wherever. Like, ah, fuck it. Throw it here. Throw it here. Whatever. I don't give a shit. It's good. It's all good. Fuck it. I w- and I I knew where to go. They would make a fucking arrow out of them. Or there would be... Uh, so in, in, in the first world, I jump on a umbrella. And that umbrella bounces me up in the air, as every umbrella that you jump on in a video game does. And I see a big gotcha ball. I hit it, and then I see a string of lines connecting one gem, and I follow that. I get to the end, you know, the pop, do do do, and it gives me a yarn. What you do is you collect a yarn to make your hats, and so I'm like, oh, cool, I got a yarn. And also, it's the game led me to this area. Oh, look, there's the there's the hourglass I have to go get. Okay, I know where to go now. Also, a Hat Girl's default hat. You press left trigger, and it points you towards where the jiggy is it just points you right where the thing that you're supposed to go to is the the weirdest thing about these games is that ukulele feels like the, a small indie team who has never made a game before in their lives made a unity game that they put up on their college website that in time <laughs> feels like a bunch of developers came back from years in the years in the past, got together and made a game like one of the old school platformers. It's so See, fucked up. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Now, the reason we are calling this old suits versus new bloods is I have this little theory parentheses game theory I met Pat about. Uh, I think the video game industry is a lot like the porn industry. Once you get over forty, you shouldn't be a part of it anymore. Like I think. Because you know the old the old saying, old you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Like that's actually true for humans too. And the video game market has just been going fast. It's been exploding and changing fucking quickly. Like what was good just ten years ago is fucking garbage now. What was good two years ago is garbage now. Like the gaming industry is just moving so fucking quick with with all these uh, changes and shit. And like. That's why people are trying to do shit like ukulele on these Kickstarters where it's like, hey guys, remember when everything was nice, slow-paced, and you can just enjoy yourself? We want to be like that. 
but no one wants that anymore because everything's all different now. So when they actually make that, no one wants it. And my my big thing is is that my example for old people ruining games is Star Fox Zero. Star Fox Zero was a game that was ruined by a seventy year old senile old man, man's stupid ideas, causing with, with with gimmicks and obsession his obsession with gimmicks ruining everything. But then a team of newer younger employees. Made Splatoon, which became so popular, it, like about almost half of every Wii U owner owned Splatoon One. It sold four million units. For reference, the Wii sold the so Wii U sold only like just over ten million, so almost half. Like, and then Splatoon Two is also a huge, giant fucking success. Then this goes up with fucking uh, look at a game like Undertale. Actually, Undertale is made by a guy who's younger than us, Tad. He's what twenty two now. Yeah, something like that. Uh, yeah, but like, he did that. Then what, what, what did Ukulele do? Another Kickstarter game by some people. Oh, they made this game that felt like shit because they're trying to capture old magic that they... That they're trying to capture themselves in the past. Back when they were fucking young. Because what you gotta think is, what... How how did you make this... When, when you were working on Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie, how did you make that game... Were you thinking, hey guys, let's make Mario 64. That was a popular game. No, you were thinking, okay guys, here's what we have. Let's look at our stuff here. What do we want to do here? What do we, how do we want to set this together? I don't know if they if they were so, so worried about people wanting that Banjo-Kazooie game again and then just completely forgot that, oh yeah, we have to like make stuff. We have to like try and put ourselves into this game and and you know, spend all this time and see there, there are things that the reason there hasn't been an N64 platform in a really long while is because they fell out of favor. Why did that happen? Let's not do those things that made those unpopular. Pretty much. You could just made all the mistakes that they made that killed the fucking genre. Like, fuck, dude. I was just about to think of another goddamn thing that old people goddamn did in video games that pissed me the fuck off. Okay, I got it, I got it. I got it. So, in, in video games, old people can still try to make a good goddamn game, but like Ted just said, they have to be very fucking careful with it. I'm just going to keep comparing it, because let's be honest, it's probably the best fucking 3D platformer in a long time, because it's been a while since we've even had like a true one. Mario Odyssey. Mario Odyssey was a game that, I think, wasn't a game in development for like six fucking years? Like, they knew that they had to try very hard to make sure everything felt uh, correct. You had to make sure that moving felt correct. There was enough rewards to incentivize you to do this and that. They had to make just exploring around looking for these dumb purple coins fun. They had to make everything feel fun to do. You know what I mean? And something like Ukulele doesn't feel fun to do. It really doesn't. Hat in time. So, so the way that you move in Ukulele is you walk or you jump or you use an ability that's on a cooldown because it costs uh, energy to do. So in Hat in Time, here's how you can move. Uh, the first hat you get is the Sprint Hat. You can hold that down and run real, real fast. Now, when you run real, real fast and you jump, you only have one jump. And then you can da- you can you can do a belly flop in the air and dash forward a bit. When you're on the ground, you can walk, you can run, you can walk, you can jump, you know, double jump. You can slide on the ground, and if you time it correctly, jump up to your feet, get a speed boost, and keep doing that to travel across an area. Or you can uh, you can hook stuff and do a hook shot kind of swinging thing. There are many more options for you to be able to traverse the ground in ukulele, or uh, <laughs> and not ukulele in Hat in Time. There's party and slip confirmed. Ukulele is the best game ever. You slay him. You got me. But it's just. I think it feels like these games should have been swapped. Like, it feels the game that didn't take advantage of all the... Because Hat in Time pulls in all of the good parts of the Actually, I have a little games. theory. I have, I have a little theory on this, Ted. So, I, I have not played Hat in Time yet. I'm going to very soon. Hopefully before like, the end of the year. Uh, but I, I, from what I've seen, because I've seen plenty of things my friends ever showed up about this game. From what I've seen and played of Ukulele, and from what I've just seen of uh, Hat in Time, Ukulele is trying to recapture the magic of an N64 style 3D platformer, when it's still very experimental of what they can do. 
Patent time seems to be more of a GameCube, so it's PS2 era. Uh, it seems to be a 6th gen platformer when people were a little more uh, focused on what they wanted to be and how they wanted to do things. A generation that did not have a world surrounded by jiggies that you collect one by one. It was objective based. You had Mario Sunshine style. A lot of it does feel very Mario Sunshine. Oh, I can tell because I've seen that the trial levels which just rip the fucking logs out of Super Mario Sunshine. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's that's all I have to say about this. I just think like it really it feels like a lot of the old people in the gaming industry are just looking back on their old days like old people do when they were in college and try to get the gang back together and prove that they still got it and they just prove that they're just old and pathetic and they're kind of just big losers. We're not moving on. So I mentioned it a little bit ago. So the biggest thing, the biggest thing I think that contributes to Hat in Time being a much better game is every single world is different. And ukulele, the worlds played out the exact same. They just had this one's jungle. This one's ice. This one's swamp. This one's a casino. So Hat in Time, first world, it's your typical, you know, that's your normal world. And even then, want to know what the second to last mission is? Changes all the water to lava. Changes how you go across that entire world. Everything's different. Uh, second world. You go in and you look, there's this giant tree. You know, you can climb up to the top of that and get some yarn and get some other dumb shit. You, you leave that tree and then what happens? Oh, the ghost dad shows up and is like, hey, I'm going to take your soul. Well, how about you sign a contract? And that's how you get your missions for that world is you sign a contract with the devil and then you go and you complete that. And then he gives you a timepiece. Then you come back. It, what happens is, and it feels so good because you, you sign a contract with the guy. And then before you can even complete that one, he makes you sign another one. You finish that when you come back in. You have to sign three more. You, you, you feel as if you're getting so far in debt to this dude that there's no way you're ever going to pay it back. Which is exactly what it's supposed to feel like. And that's really, really fun as a way to get you to do it. Uh, and even in that world. So how that one plays out is it's a giant forest. It's a fucking huge level. And they segment it off by having fire block things off. There's a segment where the forest is on fire. There's a segment where it's on like a swamp where if you touch the, if you touch the, the, uh, the ground hands will slowly come up and pull you under. So, you know, you can only touch it. Then you gotta run across it, get to the wooden planks. Uh, there's a segment where there's a village, Stuff like, I mean, they're, they're segmented, but they're kind of blocked off so that you can go and you burn portraits and it takes that fire away. You sl- you slowly unlock more and more and more of it. Ukulele had that, but it was just, hey, you come into a small world and then after you get three pages, you come out and then you make it bigger. And it's like, well, all right. I mean, I guess it kind of takes me out of it. But so even in that second world, one of your missions that one of the contracts you sign is to go to Queen Vanessa's Manor. And what that is, is it turns into like a horror game. Because you go in there, you sneak into the house, and there's this shadowy, hunched-over figure with glowing red eyes that when it gets close, the screen starts shaking violently and the music gets all distorted because you're supposed to go around her house and like you hide under a chair so she can't catch you. You know? And then just, oh, there we go. There's an experimental fun level where it turns into a fucking survival horror game. The third world. Oh, that's that's actually a great thing that you should bring up for game design is you have to change the pace up with levels all the fucking time. With ukulele, everything felt the fucking same, like you just said. But with a game like, let's say, Super Mario Sunshine. In Super Mario Sunshine, you had to change the pace of levels. Like, you go around, sliding around, hovering on flood. Well, how about this hotel level where there's barely any fucking enemies? Okay, how about this level where with uh, that, that that village with the chain chomps? You know, now you you like having fun of that little level. The entire level is on fire now. Get through it now. Yep. Or yep. all the challenge levels. You you just flood this whole time. Well, beat this challenge without flood. Hmm. Or even some missions will have the fucking that little uh, that little dude who races you. You know, you have a racing level. You have a time trial level. You have a boss fight level. It'll always change the pace but with ukulele see like that fucking cloud that clouds in every level to challenge you for a race much like much like that one but like the races never feel like different with even racing uh what's the, what's the little guy's name I don't it's know like l 
I'm going to call him El Picante. I'm going to just guess horribly wrong. Oh, the little dude in the Pianta mask? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Where you race so, him across the levels. Yeah, so with El, El Picante, you're jumping around, you're sliding around, you're going faster than him. With the cloud, you just get on the roll power, and you just roll, and we go through feathers to just constantly keep rolling. You're never, like, changing anything, you know what I mean? And, yeah. like... I don't know, man. It just feels like every single mission is repeated in Ukulele. Well, even Mario Sunshine, well, it had its, it had like El Picante in, in like three or four levels. It, it still feels, had a bunch of other levels that were completely different. It had in time feels like a game where they were so confident in how their game played out that they wouldn't shy away from, okay, the fourth world, you know how you've progressed. Like the other ones, you know, uh, the first world that's normal, for the second one where it's a movie theater, you pick a side. And, you know, you go the, on the left side is the conductor on the right side is the penguin. You know, you choose a side to you go through all the levels. You try and get as many points as you can for the side you want to win the fucking uh, the fucking second world. So the one on the right, uh, the penguin for his you're in a big city and like you go and you pose for pictures and stuff because you're like a you're like a city. You're like a diva. You're like a superstar. And the and the other one, you're on an old west train. There's a murder mystery. You go around the train, avoiding the secret agents and collecting clues to find out who was the murderer. And then after that, like it, every single level in that game felt different. The fucking fourth world, they let you. I, I, when I started it up, I went in there, and then it's like boom, open world, free roam world, no objectives. Go find all your stuff that you want to do. They just completely changed out completely different than every other world in the game. And they were willing to change that up because they're like, hey, this stuff works really, really well. But let's keep challenging ourselves to see if we can make other things work just as well. And guess what? They fucking worked. They worked real much, goddamn well. And that's pretty much it for, for explaining the difference between an old suit and new blood. A new blood's willing to challenge themselves and try new things. Well, an old suit, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. They just want to use what works. Yeah. And and one thing to remember is that new blood will eventually become old suits, you know? Yeah, 40 and, years from now, fucking Hat and Time devs will be like, man, remember when we made Hat and Time? Oh, yeah, dude, that was so cool. Let's try it again. Hey, fund us on our new Blip Starter, because that could be Kickstarter anymore. It's going to be called Blip Starter, because it's the future, Marty. And it's going to be like, hey, give us fucking five gringos and we'll fucking we'll, we'll put your face in the game and then they'll fucking make an awful fucking game. Oh, there's all you. Uh, Hat in Time also has that problem. Where is that one guy with the furry OC who gave them five thousand dollars to put his character in the game? Man, what is up with those dudes? Where do they get all that money? I think I don't we're know. in the wrong business, Ted. But that's a thing that there's like a portrait that looks shockingly different from every other type of thing in the game. And it's it's probably someone's furry oc but anyway that's that's really it uh hopefully if you're if you're new blood you want to challenge and innovate yourself you want to look at all the things you have available to you pick and choose the best bits combine it with your own ideas to make a game that is uniquely yours and not just copying what worked in the past so old i mean i would love to see the ukulele devs give it another shot if and I've learned from the mistakes and shit. Because I really, I mean, if it if it even is the original Rare team, which it very well might not even be. Well, it's not like, all of them. It's just a few of the old buddies getting back together. Yeah. It's, not, it's not like all, like, say, ten of them. It'd be like four of them. Find the old buddy that was the level designer. But yeah, I think that'll do it. So uh, we'll go ahead and we'll do the plug stuff. Uh, my name's Tad. That was Alex, who was uh, screaming for about an hour uh, I didn't actually hear a word he said. I had him on mute. Uh, you can find hey. the podcast on Twitter. <laughs> Fuck you, man. At Let Me Tell You PD. You can send us an email at Let Me Tell You About at gmail.com. Uh, there's a Discord in the description where you can find us hanging out. Uh, there's also a Patreon that people have that we have set up here. I finally figured out how to do private RSS feeds. Uh, it took me a little bit to get it set up, but uh, there's. Uh, one of the tiers gets you early access to episodes so I can show off uh, upcoming episodes a few days in advance of them so they can get them on YouTube and they can get them on uh, RSS for their podcast. Like podcast, I think Podcast Addict is the one I use. It's really good. You should use it. It's on Android. I don't know what iTunes. I don't know what you have to use if you have a, I guess, iTunes. Because the show is technically on iTunes and Google Play. 
and the website let me tell you about dot com. And wait a second. It's lmtya.com and let me tell you about dot moe. Last time I checked, let me tell you about dot com is still three thousand dollars. So I uh, won't be getting that one anytime soon. So uh, I guess uh, we'll go ahead and uh, I hate Homestuck and Alex, I absolutely hate you and everything you stand for. Well, hey, you know what they say, Ted? Big McThankies from McSpankies. I fucking hate... I'm just going to put another notch into the Alex death reasons. I was waiting an hour to say that. <laughs>